Good afternoon. I'm Ted Cacci. I'm the academic director of Notre Dame's um, Rome Global Gateway, and I'm delighted to welcome you all. Um, it's uh, very exciting to see you all here. I know it's a very busy time of the year for everyone, but I had heard that uh, my friend Gabriel is a rock star of Islamic studies, and <laughs> here we are. Standing room only. Uh, next time, I think we should get the Coliseum <laughs> and have and have it not at exam time. Um, one of the goals of the University of Notre Dame in establishing this center is to develop collaborative relationships with institutes, universities, and academies here in Rome uh, for collaborations and education, but especially. Uh, collaborations in research and graduate education in Rome. And so one of the relationships that we're most uh, excited about is the developing relationship with Pizai. And I'd like to thank Padre Cotini and Padre Diego for their presence here and all of the friends and colleagues from uh, Pizai this afternoon who are joining us for uh, Gabriel Reynolds' talk. Um, I gather that Gabriel needs no introduction to this, uh, to this public. Um, nevertheless, I just wanted to say a few words about his background and his biography. He's indeed professor of Islamic studies and theology at Notre Dame. And as you know, his research is focused above all on the Quran and Muslim Christian relations. He wrote a dissertation on the remarkable Islamic history of Christianity of Abd al-Jabbar. Um, this dissertation won the Field Prize at Yale and was published by Brill in 2004 as a Muslim theologian in the sectarian milieu. Reynolds also prepared an introduction and translation of this history that was published by BYU in 2008 as the Critique of Christian Origins. At Notre Dame, Gabriel has organized numerous uh, conferences, two international conferences on the Quran, and uh, especially of interest, I think, is the year-long project, uh, the Quran seminar that he directed, which joined, brought together a team of 28 international scholars that led to the collaboration on a commentary on the, uh, the title of the work that issued from this project is the Quran Seminar Commentary, published by um, uh, uh, Gabriel, in fact, serves on the executive board of the International Quran Studies Association. He's the author of the Quran and its biblical subtext, Rutledge, 2010, and he's also published The Emergence of Islam um, with Fortress in 2012. Um, an introduction to Quran, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, or the classical period of Islam. He's currently working on the Quran, an in conversation with the Bible, a biblically minded commentary on the Quran, which will be published by Yale in 2017. Um, at, Rain, at, at Notre Dame, uh, Professor Reynolds is, uh, teaches classes including the foundations of theology, Islam, and Christian theology the Quran and its relation to the Bible, the Holy Land, and Islamic origins. Um, this year, uh, Professor Reynolds has been a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Nantes, France. Uh, he's conducted research and delivered lectures in cities throughout the Mid Middle East, including Cairo, Jerusalem, Beirut, Damascus, Ankara, and now I'm glad to say, Rome and at the Rome Global Gateway. Please join me in welcoming Gabriel Reynolds. Good afternoon, everyone. Buonasera. Uh, thank you for coming. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much to Professor Ted Cacci of the Notre Dame Global Gateway. Thank you to all those who have given me a very warm welcome here at the Notre Dame Global Gateway. Thank you also to Father Cotini and Father Diego Cucarella of the Pontifical, Pontificio Instituto di Studi Arabi Islamistica, who have welcomed me as well today 
and um, all I can say is there's a lot of pressure on because there are distinguished colleagues here in the audience who know about all of this stuff regarding the Bible and the Quran. Um, so I'll do my best and we'll see what happens. In fact, friends, I'm going to speak about a very simple question this evening, which is the relationship between the Bible and the Quran. But I'll do so from two perspectives. First, I will discuss the relationship of the theology of the Bible and the Quran. And then I will discuss the Quran and the Bible from a literary perspective. So Quran and the Bible within the worlds of theology for Muslims and Christians, and then the Quran and the Bible as texts. We will see that these two close these two texts are closely related. Indeed, in some ways I would say they're organically related, and it can be a fruitful experience to read them together. I will argue in particular that the Quran's relationship to the Bible reflects its homiletic nature, that it has a certain analogy to works in the Christian tradition known as homilies. By this I mean that as a rule, the Quran does not retell biblical stories, does not quote or misquote the Bible. Instead, it reshapes the Bible for the sake of its own distinctive religious argument. We begin then with Christian revelation, and some of this will be quite basic for some of you, so I beg your patience as I go through this. Let us begin with theology. From a Christian perspective, revelation takes place not first of all through a book, but through the act of creation itself. In the book of Romans from the New Testament, St. Paul explains that God can be known, and indeed should be known, through nature. Here we read in the first chapter of Romans, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. The Catholic Church in Dei Verbum, a text published at the Second Vatican Council, describes this natural revelation as part of the divine plan. God wanted not only to create the world and to create humanity, but also to help humans to know him by giving them a witness to him in natural things. So we read, God, who through the word creates all things and keeps them in existence, gives men an enduring witness to himself in created realities. According to De Verbum, however, God was not content with giving humans a witness in nature. In other words, God could have created the world and left humans on their own to figure things out, to perceive God through natural things. But God went an extra step. He chose also to give humans a spoken revelation by revealing himself to the first humans. So we read in De Verbum, planning to make known the way of heavenly salvation. He went further, God went further, and from the start manifested himself to our first parents, an allusion to Adam and Eve. Of special importance is one thing which God said to Adam and Eve. In the book of Genesis, after Adam and Eve have sinned, God speaks to the serpent, who from a Christian perspective is a representation of evil, indeed of the devil, and declares, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. From a Christian perspective, this verse is not about any problematic relationship between humans and snakes, although a biblical scholar might say, ideologically speaking, this is where the text derives from, but theologically speaking, it is a prediction that evil, represented by the serpent, will eventually be overcome by good, and that through an offspring of Eve, through a man. That is why Christian theologians have long described this verse as a proto-evangelium or proto-gospel. It is a prophetic announcement of the good news that a savior, Christ, will come to humanity. Hence, we can understand the scene, if you can remember back to the movie by Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ, the opening of the movie, there's a scene where Christ is in the garden praying to God, and as he's being tempted to let the sufferings pass away from him and to not drink the cup, as the idiom has it, a serpent appears, something we don't find in the biblical text, and Christ crushes the serpent 
with his foot. Similar imagery is found at the top of the main building on the campus of the University of Notre Dame, which we have here, only in a very Catholic way, we find that Jesus is sort of put out of the picture and it's just Mary who's crushing the serpent with her foot. So this is at the top of the principal building of Notre Dame. And if you look close up, you can see Mary crushing a serpent. Some of our students have seen pictures of this. They wonder what's going on. What's going on is Genesis 3:15, but with Mary being put into the forefront. In any case, the Christian reading of this verse in Genesis is the starting point of what we can describe as a Christological perspective of divine revelation. All of human history, according to this perspective, leads to Christ. Between Adam and Christ, however, God continued to speak to humanity, to Noah, and then to those figures whom Christians call patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In a special way, God developed a relationship with the 12 sons of Jacob who would acquire the name Israel and their descendants. While God is Lord of the entire world, he chose these Israelites for a special revelation, the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai. During Israel's history, he called out to certain figures whom Jews and Christians call prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. God taught one prophet, Jonah, a lesson about his love for the entire world by having him preach to Israel's enemy, Assyria. Jonah, of course, resists and ends up in the belly of a big fish, and you probably know how the story goes. All of this sacred history reflects God's spoken revelation. So we have natural revelation and spoken revelation. With Christ, however, something new happens. Christ, from a Christian perspective, is God's personal revelation. Thus, the author, author of another New Testament book, The Letter to the Hebrews, makes a profound contrast between the way God revealed himself through the prophets and the way God revealed himself through Christ. And we read in the book of Hebrews, or the letter to the Hebrews, in many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But, this is key, now in these last days he, he has spoken to us by a son, etc., in other words, from a Christian perspective, the fullness of revelation is not nature and is not the words given to prophets, but is a person, Christ himself. This is why Christ himself is known by Christians as the word of God, something seen most clearly in the opening of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And although we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, we might note here already that in two places the Qur'an speaks of Christ with similar terminology. In Al-Amran, the third chapter or surah of the Qur'an, we see Christ referred to as Kalima, the Word of God. And again in An-Nisa, the fourth chapter of the Qur'an, verse 171. By the way, just as by way of introduction, we might remind ourselves the Qur'an is a book divided into 114 chapters or surahs. It's a relatively short book. It's about two thirds the size of the New Testament, written in Arabic by tradition revealed to the prophet between the years, the traditional dates are 610 and 632 AD. Tellingly, in Quran chapter three, verse 45, Surat Al-Amran, Jesus is described as a word and not the word from God, Whereas in Anisa, verse 171, Jesus is his word which he cast into Mary. Kalimatahu alqaha ila Maryam. Also, we have a reference in Surah Maryam, verse 34, Surah 19, where Jesus is qawl al haq Not kalima here, but qawl. Still, even if this Christian language has entered into the Quran, from an Islamic perspective, these expressions have a much more limited sense and certainly do not imply the divinity of Christ. For Christians, on the other hand, the fullness of divine revelation is the person of Christ, and that is why sometimes we hear it's better not to compare the Bible and the Qur'an, but rather Jesus and the Qur'an, which, the Qur'an that is, for Muslims is the very word which has come from heaven. Or are we sometimes hear, and this is still more intriguing, I think, that we can compare Mary who from a Christian perspective bore the word of God inside of her and the prophet Muhammad 
who from a Muslim perspective bore the word of God inside of him. But let's get back to the point. If Jesus is the word of God, what place does this leave for the Bible, which a Christian might also speak about as the word of God? From a Christian perspective, the Bible is not the word of God in the same sense as the Quran is the word of God for Muslims. It is not munzal, it is not a book which has been brought down from heaven to earth. The Bible is rather a record of God's relationship with humanity and God's working towards the salvation of humanity. It preserves God's word. So we read in Dei Verbum, in his gracious goodness, God has seen to it that what he had revealed for the salvation of all nations would abide perpetually in its full integrity, the Bible as a record. Here we might pause for a moment to make an important distinction. This is the second pause. While the New Testament contains four Gospels, the Quran speaks of God revealing a scripture before the Quran named the Injil. Now this Arabic term Injil derives from the Greek term for gospel, Uangelion, perhaps through Syriac, perhaps through Ethiopic, scholars debate the etymology, for which reason this Injil leads people to say that the Quran speaks of a gospel. Again we can say that Christian language has entered the Quran, but again the Quran has a different conception. The Christian idea of Injil or that is the Islamic idea, or the Quranic idea of Injil, is unlike the Christian idea of Gospels. And just to confuse things a little bit further, Arabic Christians often speak of the New Testament simply as El Injil, or sometimes as the entire Bible as El Injil. Yet according to the Quran, the Injil is a book brought down from heaven to earth unto Jesus, much as the Quran is a book brought down from heaven to earth to Muhammad. We read, for example, in the third chapter of the Quran, Al-Amran, he hath revealed unto thee, that is to the Prophet, a scripture with truth, Musadda Kalima Baini Yadeh, confirming that which was revealed before it, even as he revealed the Torah and the Injil, wa anzala tawrat wal Injil. In the New Testament, however, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not books given to Jesus, but accounts of the deeds and words of Jesus. This is a problem where we have one word being used in two different ways. And the example I'd like to use for this is the word dessert. When I think of the word dessert, I might mean some fruit or maybe a little bit of ice cream. When my kids think of the word dessert, they think of a lot of ice cream with chocolate on it and whipped cream. Otherwise, it's not dessert. Still, it is important to emphasize how the church teaches that all of the Bible, the Old and New Testament, was written under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We read, those divinely revealed realities which are contained and presented in sacred scripture have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The church also teaches, and this is an important point, that the word or the revelation revealed in the Bible will never pass away. The Christian dispensation, therefore, as the new and definitive covenant, will never pass away, and we now await no further new public revelation. Thus, according to the Christian conception, there are three sorts of revelation. Natural revelation, verbal revelation, and personal revelation. The greatest of these is the personal revelation of God in Christ. It is definitive and will never pass away onto the Islamic conception of revelation. Well, at this point, that is what I've just said about the Christian conception of revelation, obviously distinguishes Christian doctrine from that of Islam. There is still much in common between the Christian and Islamic views of revelation. For Islam too, the things of nature are signs, Arabic ayat, which point to God. Many Quranic passages give specific examples of these signs, as in Quran 699. It is he who sends down water from the sky and brings forth with it every kind of growing thing. We can read the whole passage. The end of the passage is, فِذَلِكُمَ لَأَيَّاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يُؤْمِنُونَ In that, there are signs for a people who have faith. The Quran, one might say, sees nature as a mirror of divine power. 
By looking at nature, one is able to recognize God. But we might add two additional points to this. First, the Qur'an ceased to argue not only for the existence and the power of God by pointing to science and nature, but also to the reality of the resurrection of the body. In passages such as Qaf, or Surah 50, verses 6 to 11, the Qur'an presents the bringing back to life of a dry land as a parallel to God's ability to raise dead bodies to life. Again, a reference to rain. We send down from the sky salubrious water with which we grow gardens and the grain which is harvested in tall date palms with regularly arranged blossoms, etc. Likewise will be the rising. كذلك الخروج. Second, the Quran expects not only that humans will recognize the existence of God by examining the signs of God in nature, but that humans will respond to that recognition with gratitude. To this end, Surah An-Nahl, Nahl, Quran 16, calls on humans to give thanks to God even for their senses. We read, Allah has brought you forth from the bellies of your mothers while you did not know anything. He gave you senses. He invested you with hearing, sight, and hearts so that you may give thanks. La'alakum tashkurun. A few verses later, this same sort of speaks of various blessings God has given and speaks of them as reasons for why humans should submit to God. Again in Surah An-Nahl. It is Allah who made for you the shade from which He has created, made for you retreats in the mountains, and made for you garments that protect you from the heat. This is how He com completes His blessings upon you so that you may submit to Him. And of course we may note that the ending of this after يُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكُمْ لَعَلَكُمْ تُسْلِمُونَ And this word تُسْلِمُونَ of course is related to the Arabic verb أَسْلَمَ which is related to the term Islam. And the last phrase can also be understood to mean in order that you will be Muslims. To the Japanese scholar of Islam, Toshihiko Izutsu, the Qur'an's vision of God's graces in nature and human gratitude and recompense is the human counterpart of the initial divine goodness. On creation, Izutsu writes, the Qur'an may be regarded in a certain sense as a grand hymn in honor of divine creation. At any rate, the whole Qur'an is literally impregnated with the thought of creation and a profound admiration for it. Yet in addition to these natural signs, the Qur'an also describes God's verbal signs, the word which he has given to prophets. These two are referred to in the Qur'an with the same Arabic word as ayat, for which reason the verses of the Qur'an are known as ayat. Thus, for example, when Abraham and his son, Ismail or Ishmael, not Isaac, pray in chapter 2 of the Qur'an for a prophet to be raised up for their people, Muslims read this incidentally as a prophecy of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad. They ask God that he will be one who will recite God's ayat. We read, O Lord, raise amongst them an apostle from among them who will recite to them your signs and teach them the book. Yatlu alayhim ayatika wa al-kitab. Thus for the Qur'an too, we can distinguish between natural revelation and the verbal revelation given to prophets. God sends prophets as warners so that humans will turn back to God and avoid divine punishment. Qur'an 17.15 declares, we do not punish any community until we have sent it an apostle. From the Qur'an's perspective, this warning given by prophets is itself an expression of divine mercy. Thus we understand why the Qur'an speaks of its own prophet as a mercy in Qur'an 21, where God declares, we did not send you, this is second person singular, the prophet, but as a mercy to all the nations. In any case, another way to think of this natural and verbal revelation is to think simply of two kinds of ayat. First, the ayat or the signs which are non-verbal, the signs of nature, Second, the signs which are verbal, the, the words or the verses of prophets. 
Now the nonverbal signs are visible to all people, and the verbal signs are given only to a prophet. However, they are preserved in a scripture available to mankind, and hence we can understand the importance, importance of the notion of the collection of the Qur'an in Islamic tradition, jama and Qur'an. For Muslims, of course, the Qur'an is the very words of God, the ipsissima verba dei. Yet there's one piece still missing in the puzzle of Islamic revelation, because in order to have a full image of divine revelation from an Islamic perspective, and especially from a Sunni Islamic perspective, it is important to remember that the Prophet for Islam is not only a warner or a messenger, the Prophet is also an exemplar or an uswa, to use the Quranic term. God sends a Prophet not only that people will listen to the revelations he receives from an angel, but also that people will imitate him. It is the second role of the Prophet, his exemplary role, which is used to justify the importance of the Hadith, those reports which preserve the Prophet's example. Thus, from an Islamic point of view, we also have three sorts of revelation, although they are different. The signs of nature, the signs given to a Prophet, and the Prophet himself as a sign. So we might use these two simple diagrams to summarize the notions of revelation in Christianity and Islam. And this brings us on to the second step of the lecture. You've survived half of it. The second half can't be that bad. The literary relationship. We have seen that from a theological perspective, the role which the Bible plays in Christianity is unlike the role which the Quran plays in Islam. Yet from a literary perspective, both the Bible and the Quran are texts. What is more, they are texts with much in common. They share a similar cosmology or vision of heaven and earth. They share a similar view of sacred history. Both scriptures give a central role to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to Jesus, and to Mary. They also share a similar eschatology, or their vision of the end times and divine judgment. Both texts speak of the resurrection and of heaven and hell. And yet the relationship between the Bible and the Quran is more complicated than it might seem at first. The Quran, even if it refers frequently to biblical characters, even if it alludes to biblical narratives, rarely cites biblical texts. And I'll give some examples which show the Qur'an's way of applying biblical terms of phrase, but not actually quoting from biblical passages. This is an important distinction. For example, the Qur'an speaks of uncircumcised hearts in two passages where it has the Israelites say, قُلُوبُنَا غُلْفٌ It's an allusion to uncircumcised hearts, which is a very common biblical metaphor, a polemical biblical metaphor. The Qur'an speaks of a camel passing through the eye of the needle. This is Qur'an, Surah Al-Araf, chapter 7, verse 40. And it uses the example of a mustard seed to refer to something very small, another New Testament image that we find in the Qur'an. However, in each of these cases, the Qur'an applies the biblical turn of phrase to a different teaching. For example, whereas the Bible relates that a camel will pass through the eye of a needle before a rich man enters heaven, the Qur'an reports that those who deny God's signs will not enter heaven before a camel passes through the eye of the needle. And just one third pause here, one more pause. I, don't, I can't promise if it will be the last one. But just how books, like books have footnotes, so talks can have footnotes. So here's a footnote. In both cases, both in the New Testament case and the Quranic case, we find that there's an alternative strand or current of interpretation according to which the commentators propose it's, there's no way that the text can actually be speaking of a camel. So we have the Greek of the New Testament being amended so that the reference is not to a camel passing through the eye of the needle, but to a thick rope. We find this among some church fathers. And we have almost the identical interpretation among some Mufassirun who say here it can't be Jamal, 
can't be camel. It's rather something like jumal, which is an accumulation of smaller strands to form a large rope again. In both cases, the metaphor seemed impossible. Okay, back to the main lecture. The textual relationship between the Bible and the Quran is thus complicated. We don't find the Quran citing biblical passages, but applying certain biblical turns of phrase, and as we're about to see, alluding to certain biblical narratives. Indeed, in order to illustrate this complicated relationship, I will focus on two Quranic passages which allude to two different biblical narratives and consider the relationship to the Bible. The first of these is Noah and his son, and I feel guilty for cutting off Noah's head in this image. It was not meant uh, either to censure the presentation of a prophet from a religious perspective or uh, because I have any hostility to Noah, it was just my bad technological skills. And the second is Moses and Pharaoh. Both of these narratives will show how the Quran develops material in the Bible in order to advance a particular argument, and in this case, the same argument, namely that the bonds or the ties of faith are more important than the bonds or the ties of family. The Quran on Noah, the Quran includes seven significant Noah narratives. Now we have a second reference to the Bible in Hollywood. I already spoke about the Passion of the Christ. Of course, this is the Noah movie that was produced a few years ago, which completely reshapes the whole Noah story and makes him into sort of an insane figure who wants to kill his grandchildren. So I'm not endorsing that reading of the Noah story. The Quran includes seven significant Noah narratives and refers to Noah in numerous other passages. The Noah of the Quran is unlike the Noah of the Bible and unlike the Noah of the movie, inasmuch as the center of the Qur'anic narratives is not the flood, but rather the confrontation between Noah and his opponents, which precedes the flood, which comes before the flood. Indeed, in terms of their shape, the narratives of Noah in the Qur'an are like the narratives of the other prophets in the Qur'an, in these stories known, for good reason, in Western scholarship, as punishment stories, Straflegenden, to use the... German term with which they were coined. In several surahs, especially surahs 7, 11, 26, 37, and 54, the Quran includes a series of stories according to which the prophet is called, first, the prophet preaches to his people and warns them of divine punishment, second, and God destroys the unbelievers and saves the prophet together with a small group of believers. Some of the prophets of these stories, such as Hud, Saleh, and Shu'aib, are unknown to the Bible. Others, including Noah, Lot, and Moses, are biblical figures. The Quran, one guesses, chose to reflect on the biblical narrative of Noah, or that of Lot, or that of Moses, but not those of, say, Isaiah, or Ezekiel, or Jeremiah, because of the plotline of the narrative ending in the Bible as it does, with the protagonist and his family saved, and everyone else destroyed. This is easily adapted into the format of punishment stories, which the Qur'an uses to advance its religious exhortations. At the same time, the de details of the biblical narrative form a certain frame of the Qur'anic account. The Qur'an could not, for example, have the people of Noah destroyed by fire, and the people of Lot destroyed in a flood since we imagine that the details of the biblical story were already known by the Qur'an's audience. For our purposes tonight, I'd like to point out how the Qur'anic material differs, and it differs in two ways in regard to Noah. First, the preaching of Noah in the Qur'an, and second, the appearance in the Qur'an of a son of Noah who doesn't appear in the Bible. As for the matter of Noah's preaching, the Qur'an includes a number of long narratives in which Noah, seven in all, to give a number, in which Noah speaks to his people in order to convince them to believe in God and to accept him as a prophet. Here's one example in Surah Al-Araf, Surah 7. We have this dialogue between Noah and his people in which he concludes, verse 61, O my people, I am not in error, rather I am, I am an apostle, 
from the Lord of all the worlds. If that's the right translation of Alameen, maybe the Lord of all people is a better translation here. Such passages are quite unlike Genesis. In fact, they're entirely unlike Genesis. In Genesis, Noah does not speak a single word until he has left the ark and started a new life. Of course, in the movie it's different. He says a lot of things, but that need not bother us. Yet it is interesting to note the reference in the New Testament, not in Genesis, but in the New Testament, to Noah as a great preacher. We find this in a letter known as the second letter of Peter. And we read in verse 5 of chapter 2, He did not spare the world in ancient times. He saved only Noah, the preacher of uprightness, along with seven others. Both of those things can interest us because in a moment we're going to speak about Noah having only one son in the Quran. Here there's a reference to seven, which is his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. But the other reference is what we're focused on now, which is this idea that Noah is a preacher of righteousness or uprightness. How could he have been a preacher when he says nothing in Genesis? One can only imagine that the author of Second Peter understood that if Noah were truly righteous, because indeed Genesis 6-9 describes him as a righteous man, if he were truly righteous, he must have said something to the people of generation, of his generation. He must have warned them of divine punishment. This line of speculation, which begins in 2 Peter, continues in later Jewish and Christian writings. And I'll introduce three here. First of all, in the Jewish Babylonian Talmud, we read, The righteous Noah rebuked his people, urging, Repent, for if not, the Holy One, blessed be he, will bring a deluge upon you and cause your bodies to float upon the water like gourds. But this tradition of Noah as a preacher also entered into Christian literature. St. Ephraim, the 4th century Syriac father, in his commentary on Genesis, writes that Noah preached not just a bit, but for 100 years. And Noah said to them, Some of all flesh will come to be saved with me in the ark. And they mocked him. Notice also in the Quran we have this back and forth between the prophet and his opponents. How will all the beasts and birds that are scattered throughout every corner of the earth come from all those regions? Again, we have another text, particularly interesting, because it comes from just before the time of the Quran, from Jacob of Serug, the 6th century Syriac father, who also reports that Noah preached to his people in his work on the flood. Again, he reports that Noah preached for a hundred years. 500 years he remained in the beauty of his virginity. People say that priestly celibacy is a great challenge. He did it for 500 years. 100 years he preached to and admonished the children of his race. The references in Ephraim and Jacob are particularly interesting, of course, because of the proximity of the language, Syriac, in which they were written, to the language of the Quran, Arabic. It helps us to see that the way in which the Quran presents Noah as a preacher is not new, but rather consistent with the way in which the Christians of its historical context thought of him. As for the second matter, not Moses yet, but the second matter dealing with Noah, we'll do this quickly, and we'll get through it together. As for the second matter, Noah's son, or we might say Noah's lost son, he also appears, in, or he appears rather in Surah Hud, not Surah Al-Araf, which we were speaking about earlier, in Surah Hud, chapter 11. Here the Quran describes how God commanded Noah to enter into the ark, relates Noah's conversation with his son, who refuses to join him, and presents the subsequent conversation between God and Noah, in which Noah intercedes for his son and is reprimanded by God. We have the text here. Noah's son, of course, he says, I shall take refuge on a mountain. It will protect me from the flood. Bad idea. His father says, There is none today who can protect you from Allah's edict except someone upon whom he has mercy. Then the waves came between them, etc., etc. As the story continues, we find that Noah seems to complain about the drowning of his son. This is a poignant moment which some scholars have looked, looked at as an example of a prophet 
in a moment of crisis between devotion to family and devotion to God. He declares, My Lord, my son is indeed from my family. Your promise is indeed true. But God rebukes him by declaring, He is not of your family. Now this phrase, He is not of your family, could be understood to mean that this son was really not Noah's son. And indeed, some Islamic traditions relate that the son was the offspring of an illicit relationship between Noah's wife and another man. And this is connected to something we find in Surah the tahrim chapter 66 of the Quran, which presents Noah's wife as an unfaithful woman. That's a minority position, however. And more likely, anyway, the Quran presumably means that the son is no longer to be thought of as a son. He's been cut off because he chose to be with the unbelievers. Thus, this conversation between Noah and God reminds us of an important doctrine of the Quran, that faith comes before family. The same lesson is taught in the various Quranic passages which describe Abraham's conversation with not his son, but his father, who in the Quran, and this too follows Jewish and Christian tradition, appears not only as an idolater, as a mushrik, but as a maker of idols, or we should say Abd al-Asnam, I guess, Abraham rebukes his father, who's named Azar by the Quran, and Terah by Genesis, for his idolatry. While the crime or the, the heresy of Noah's son is not stated, we can assume that he's considered to be an unbeliever because he chooses to be with the unbelievers. Thus, while Abraham rejects his father ultimately for his unbelief, Noah is told to reject his son for his unbelief. The case of Noah's unbelieving son, in any case, makes a dramatic contrast with the Bible. In Genesis, of course, Noah has three sons, and they all get in the boat. In the Quran, Noah has one son, and he doesn't get in the boat. And there is no sign of such a son, not in the New Testament, nor in later Jewish or Christian writings. And so, the case of Noah's lost son, is presented by many scholars as an example of the difference or the contrast between the Bible and the Quran. But close examination might show that there's a connection after all. The first step toward understanding why Noah has an unbelieving in this a son in the Quran is to appreciate the prophetic book of Ezekiel in the, in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel 14, the point is made that the merits of a father will do nothing for a sinful son. Ezekiel uses the example of Noah, and presumably because Noah's son is known for righteousness, and possibly because one of the sons of Noah, Ham, seems to be unrighteous in a story later in Genesis. In any case, Ezekiel uses the example of Noah along with Daniel and Job to make this point. And we read the passage here, ending with, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. And this passage becomes in later Jewish and Christian exegesis in tension with the Jewish notion of zekut avoth, the merits of the fathers. Can the merits of the fathers redound to the children? This passage suggests that they can't. Indeed, we'll see that it's used in later Christian anti-Jewish polemical writings to argue against the notion of zekut avoth in order to show that even if the ancestors of, of the Jews were righteous, the prophets and the patriarchs, none of that righteousness redounds unto them. In any case, in this passage, God speaks hypothetically of a sinful son of Noah who would hypothetically die despite the righteousness of his father. As a later passage in Ezekiel puts it, the soul that sins shall die. In the Quran, this hypothetical son of Noah, in my opinion, becomes a real son who really dies. One parallel case might be the example of the two disputants who come before David in a later passage in the Quran. In the biblical story, these are hypothetical disputants in a parable told by the prophet Nathan. In the Quran, they become two real men who really come before David and he really decides between the two. The Quran also applies the story of Noah's lost son to a different argument, namely that believers in its God should break their bounds with unbelievers, even if they are family members. 
This lesson is taught explicitly in Surah At-Tawbah, which, chapter 9, which refers to the account of Abraham and his father. The prophet and the faithful may not plead for the forgiveness of the polytheists, etc., etc. And then we read at the end that Abraham's pleading forgiveness for his father was only to fulfill a promise he made him. Here we have an interesting case of something like intra-textuality. We have Quranic passages which speak of Abraham praying to his father, and here we have another Quranic passage in Surah at tawbah which alludes to those passages. Thus the incident of Noah and his unbelieving son is part of a Quranic theme. Abraham and Noah both pleaded to God for an unbelieving family member and their prayers were denied. Thereby the followers of Quran's prophet know not to pray for the unbelievers, at least not for their forgiveness, although maybe for their guidance, and we could speak about the distinction later if you'd like. More importantly, they learn that faith comes before family. And we're on to the final element of this talk, I promise, which is Moses. And some of you might recognize a second image from the campus of the University of Notre Dame. First we saw Mary crushing a snake. Here we see Moses pointing to the sky. Of course, he's pointing to God. But some of you may know that at Notre Dame, this statue is known as First Down Moses. In order for that to make sense, you have to know something about American football. And it gets very complicated. And so let's just move on. <laughs> let's just call this Moses and be done with it. A similar lesson, faith before family, can be derived from the surah entitled Ash-Shu'ara, uh, Quran 26, where the Quran relates a conversation between Pharaoh and Moses. Now the place of Pharaoh in the Quran is very interesting. We could speak about that too. It seems that we have only one Pharaoh in the Quran. We'll get to that a bit. We have Fir'aun in Surah Yusuf, for example. The ruler of Egypt is only called a king. He's never called Fir'aun. But in the passages dealing with Moses, we have, uh, we have Fir'aun. In the course of the conversation between Pharaoh and Moses, Pharaoh reminds Moses of the way he raised him as his child. Did we not rear you as a child among us? Then you committed that deed of yours, and you are an ingrate. Interesting, the word for ingrate is kafirin, of course related to kufr, but here it, it clearly means ingrate, someone who's not grateful and Although some of the Mufassirun entertain the possibility it could mean kafir in the sense of unbeliever. But that's not the evident meaning in my opinion. In any case, the point is that Pharaoh alludes to the fact that, by the way, I hope this is clear, the deed of yours is an allusion to, to Moses' murder of an Egyptian. Okay, all of that aside, back to the main point, which is that Pharaoh suggests that Moses was raised in his own house Indeed, there's a suggestion that possibly Moses is Pharaoh's own son. Indeed, although this verse does not say, say so explicitly, when it's read in conjunction with Quran 28, where Pharaoh's wife alludes to the possibility of adopting Moses, we have this sense that Pharaoh in the Quran is indeed the father, that is the adoptive father of Moses. These two passages in Quran 26 and 28 are related to Exodus 2.10, which relate how Moses' mother, after nursing her boy, brought the child to Pharaoh's daughter. That is, in Exodus, it's not Pharaoh's wife, but Pharaoh's daughter who adopts Moses. <coughs> Thus we can appreciate that the Quran shapes the story of Moses' adoption for its own purpose. It's important to emphasize above all that the scene where Pharaoh confronts Moses is a reunion. The same Pharaoh who raised Moses as a child is the same Pharaoh whom Moses confronts in his adulthood. Indeed, in Exodus, there are two different Pharaohs. The Pharaoh whom Moses confronts, here's this passage we just alluded to, the Pharaoh whom Moses confronts in Exodus is not the Pharaoh in whose court Moses was raised. And we know this because if we put two different passages together, we read that in Exodus 2, the Pharaoh who was around in Moses' childhood wants to kill Moses. And then in Exodus 4, God tells Moses, all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So a new Pharaoh, a Pharaoh has come to the throne. And that's the Pharaoh whom Moses confronts. I hope that makes sense. So 
two pharaohs in Exodus, one pharaoh in the Quran. And the reason is, according to my opinion, the Quran wants a family conflict between Pharaoh, the father, and Moses, the son. This point was already made, the difference between Exodus and, and the Quran in this respect, a long time ago in the 1833 work of Abraham Geiger, Vashat Muhammad Astam Yudentum Aufgenommen. So nothing new there, except that Geiger believed that the Quran simply confused things, perhaps because of the influence of a Midrashic tradition in a text, Exodus Rabbah, which is actually later than the Quran. In fact, in my opinion, there's no confusion, but a rather a strategic de decision of the Quran's author. The Quran wants to have a scene like the scenes of Noah and his son and Abraham and his father, where you have a family conflict, this time between Moses and his adoptive father. The way in which the Quran makes the encounter between Pharaoh and Moses a family affair reflects this central theme of its religious exhortation, which can be found in other passages. God is greater than family. For example, when the prophet preaches to the unbelievers, one of their first excuses is, we will stick to our family's religion. We will rather follow what we have found our fathers following. One poignant scene that could be used to describe this, not in the Quran, uh, I'm focusing on Quran, but I can't resist the temptation to mention the famous scene where the Prophet is at the deathbed of his uncle Abu Talib, who of course has protected the Prophet during his life, and the Prophet implores him to accept Islam, and Abu Talib says, if I, if, I, if I were not afraid that the Quraysh would laugh at me, I would be ready to accept it. Instead, I will stick to the religion of Abd al-Muttalib, the, the father of the grandfather of the Prophet and the father of Abu Talib. So again, one sticks to the religion of the father instead of embracing the religion of God. Again, another passage where this theme is expressed, when they are called, told, come to what Allah has sent down, they say, sufficient for us is what we have found our fathers following. We even find the Quran declaring that one should not befriend those who prefer faithlessness to faith, even if they're in the same family, even if they're your fathers and your brothers. The portrayal of Moses in the Quran is also parallel to the portrayal of Joseph. So we have four Quranic characters we're speaking about tonight. First Noah, then Abraham, then Moses, and now Joseph. Of particular interest for our purposes is the parallel between the way Potiphar, in the Quran, of course, Potiphar is named El Aziz, speaks to his wife in Quran 1221 of adopting Joseph, and the way Pharaoh's wife speaks to her husband in Quran 289 of adopting Moses. The exact same expression is used, and you can see the two passages there. In both cases, the Prophet ultimately separates himself from his adoptive parents. After his conflict with Potiphar's wife, who, by the way, doesn't act very much like a mother, Joseph is sent to prison, and that according to his own wish, even though Potiphar recognizes his innocence. After his conflict with an Egyptian, of course, Moses flees to Midian. Thus the Quran means to present the story of Moses and Pharaoh according to a certain topos or theme, seen also with Noah, Abraham, and Joseph according to which prophets choose God over family. The point of this, and this is always the point for the Quran, is to deliver a message to its own audience, to follow the example of the prophets who preached to, confronted, and when necessary, abandoned their family in order to dedicate their lives to God. Indeed, the passage which concerns us in Surah 26 of the Quran seems to make this passage, or this message rather, particularly dramatic. At the end of this dialogue, Pharaoh compares himself to a god. Indeed, he deifies himself. He says, if you take up any god other than me, I will surely make you a prisoner. So the choice is between Moses' adoptive father, the false god, and the true god. Finally, in conclusion, just a thought or two about some interfaith implications of all of this. The Quranic theme of choosing God over family should be familiar to Christians as well. The Gospel of Matthew has Jesus predict that his message will divide family members against each other. He insists that only those who love him more than their family are worthy of him. 
and we read, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In another gospel tradition, Jesus declares, truly I say to you, there is no man who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children, etc., who will not receive manifold more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. It might also be noted, and I think it's important to add this, that in all of the cases we have discussed, the cases from the Quran and now from the Bible, there is no threat of force against unbelievers, whether they're family members or otherwise. Bonds are broken, but the unbelievers are left in the hands of God to deal with as He pleases. We are called, in other words, to remain faithful to God, but we are not called on to punish or even condemn those who refuse to believe or even those who leave the community of believers. It is God who deals with Noah's son and not Noah. It is God who deals with Pharaoh and not Moses. One thinks of the way the, the, way the Quran has God say to Jesus after speaking about or alluding to his unfaithful followers at the end of Quran 355, then to me will be your return, whereat I will judge between you concerning that about which you used to differ. Thus, even if the Quran and the Bible encourage people to choose God over unbelief, they do not give any permission to punish or to seek vengeance against the unbelievers. Believers are free to believe, unbelievers are free not to believe, or to believe in something else. Finally, the Quran's interest in the theme of faith over family is presumably connected to the particular circumstances of its development. One imagines that the Quran's prophet wanted to encourage his family to be faithful, or his followers rather, to be faithful to their new community and to break off ties with those who are outside of that community. In any case, we see that the way the Quran differs from the Bible, at least in these two cases, is not random or accidental. The Quran transforms biblical accounts. It makes the hypothetical son of Noah into a real son. It turns Moses into the adopted son of Pharaoh, but it does so with a purpose. In this we can see a parallel between the Quran and the Christian tradition of homily. The Quran's, Quran's author, like a homilist, retells biblical stories in a way that advances his particular religious argument. Indeed, it is interesting to note that at the time of the Quran's origins, we see the flourishing of the tradition of Syriac Christian homilies or memre, but that is a different topic for a different lecture at another time. Thank you. Beautiful, beautifully delivered, and so clearly structured lecture. Um, would you take questions and comments? We'd like to open up the discussion. Please, we'd like to start. Sir. Thank you for that. It's brilliant. Uh, so, push the conclusion and say that the Quran participates in what's happening in uh, the Anatolia at this period, the 6th century, it's just it's participating in what Darsai and Ephraim and Aparhat, it's just an, another reshaping of the Bible like what the Targum is doing. Um, just say, well, so it's, it's part of this tradition, it's emerging. How would that be received in the uh, Islamic community? Right, excellent question, thank you very much. I, I would say to that, although I draw the parallel to the tradition of Christian homilies at the end and at the beginning of the talk, the answer is yes and no. So, so yes in as much as the Quran, like homiletical works, has this organic relationship with the Bible. Very often stories in the Quran are only fully under, comprehensible if you know the biblical subtext. So just to give one example, the story of Jonah or the story of Cain and Abel are alluded to very, very generally, Jonah in a couple of sources, including uh, 37, uh, 21, the story of Cain and Abel in Surah 5. Uh, but you need the biblical story to make, make it out. In each case, as with Jonah and Cain and Abel, there's 
a homiletic message that comes after. With Cain and Abel, we have the famous verse where the Quran says, for this re reason we've written to the, to the Israelites that anyone who kills a soul, it's as though he's killed the whole world, etc. So, yes, but then also no, <laughs> because um, the Quran, after all, is a text which c claims prophetic authority. Now, the homilists like Jacob of Sarug or Narsai or Ephraim, they call down at the, oftentimes in introductory passages at the beginning of the memory for God to inspire them as they do they write their works. So there's the inspiration of, of God through the Holy Spirit in their works. But the Quran, of course, very often it speaks simply in the words of God. Very often the Quran, for example, doesn't even say, Qala Allah. Sometimes it does, but very often it just simply gives the words of God. Uh, so we could use almost any example to speak of this. Um, the Quran, for example, in Quran chapter 2, verse 30, uh, there we have your Lord has said to the angels but when we have um, passages towards the end of the Quran for example in the Quran 97 indeed we have brought it down on the night of power the Quran simply speaks in the words of God so this is fundamentally different and we can't underestimate the importance of the prophetic nature of the Quran as well possible to account accurately the reason or the sources behind the organic relationship theologically perhaps, between the Quran and the Bible. Could you repeat the question please? It, is, it, is it possible to accurately um, source or identify the um, how this organic relationship between the Bible and the Quran emerge. Yes, okay, thank you very much for that. My understanding is that there was no translation of the Bible into Arabic at the time of the Quran's origins. So we're speaking about an oral process. There's, of course, Islamic tradition would insist the Prophet is illiterate anyway and wasn't relying on any written text. But even if we set that aside just for a moment, we just notice historically that the Bible is not yet translated into Arabic. And there are different, different scholars who have worked on this. Most recently, Sidney Griffith, the Bible in Arabic. He has dedicated um, several parts of that book to this question and shows, I think, that decisively that in the early 7th century, the Bible had not yet been translated into Arabic. So there's no question even of whether the Bible had reached Mecca or Medina. It simply didn't exist yet in Arabic. So we're speaking of an, of an oral question. And what we find are a couple of interesting things. Just, I don't want to give a second lecture here. <laughs> but one thing we find is the Quran never uses biblical terminology for the various elements of the biblical text. So as I mentioned in the main talk, we don't have any talk of gospels. Enajil is never mentioned in the Quran. It's always injil, it's gospel. And it's not used for one of the written gospels. It's used in a different way. We have no mention of the Jewish categories of Torah prophets and writings. We have no mention of Old Testament or New Testament. We don't have any biblical book, even outside of the Gospels, referred to by name. So that already tells us that we're not dealing with an intimate conversation with the Bible as a written text. But we do have an intimate conversation with biblical traditions. And those traditions come from both the canonical Bible and outside of the canonical Bible. So when the Qur'an, for example, in chapter 3 and then again in chapter 5, speaks about the miracles of Jesus, some of those miracles, for example, healing leprosy or raising the dead, are known from the canonical Bible. Also, healing the blind is also mentioned. But others, such as what are sometimes called the sapiential miracles of Jesus, where he knows, uh, he knows what people eat, he knows what they're hiding in their houses, these are traditions that come from outside of um, the New Testament, as is the tradition, for example, of Jesus forming a bird from clay and bringing it to life. So all of that suggests that we're dealing with an oral context in which these stories were being circulated. They were not being read in Arabic, but translated orally from other languages, principally Syriac, into Arabic. Good evening, I am Ambassador uh, of Iraq, Omar Barzanji. 
I think is, uh, if I speak my Arabic, this is my uh, translate for me is better. I'm Muslim and she's Christian. <laughs> <laughs> إذا كان ممكن نكون هناك أفضل معكم حتى يشوفون الجميع. then أنا حقيقة منذ فترة قصيرة سفير لجمهورية العراق في الفاتيكان. وحقيقة هذا الموضوع الحيوي أسعدني كثيرا اليوم. وأنا أتصور فتح هذه الأبواب تضيع الفرصة على الإرهابيين حتى لا يحققوا أهدافهم. نحن عندما ننقطع عن بعض ولا نعرف ثقافة بعض ودين بعض هذه فرصة للإرهاب لأن يضربنا جميعا ونبشركم بانتصارات كبيرة الآن بالعراق على الأرض وإذا تلاحظون من خلال المحاضرة القيمة ستجدون أن القرآن هو مكمل للتوراة والإنجيل وللكتب السماوية الأخرى and you have proof that the Quran is a continuity for the Bible and for the Torah. الآية الموجودة في الوقت الحاضر على البورد حقيقة دلالة عظيمة على أن القرآن يعظم السيد المسيح أكبر تعظيم. And now it was now written on the on the board showing that how how great was Jesus. ومن يتبع السيد المسيح لأنه الآية واضحة. هو ومن اتبعه. القرآن الكريم ذكر السيد المسيح وحده فقط أنه أحيا الموتى وأشفى الأعمى والأب والأبرص والأمراض الأخرى. لست أنا المحاضر حتى لا أكون المحاضر أختصر ولكن أقول القرآن حينما يعظم السيد المسيح بالآيات الكثيرة جدا دلالة على أنه القرآن يأتي يؤيد ويكمل المسيرة فكل الكتب السماوية معا تتكامل that what we see is the Quran mentions the, about the Jesus and what he has done and the greatness of Jesus. That means that um, the Quran uh, um, gives all the, all the other religions their importance and it gives, let's say, the, um, the frame, to frame all, the, all the, the religions together. وإذا رأت الجامعة في فترة أخرى في فرصة أخرى أن تكون لي كلمة أو محاضرة في هذا الجانب لأنني أحمل ماجستير في دبلوماسية حوار الحضارات والثقافات. وشكرا جزيلا. شرف. شرف. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, my my question would be, uh, as a as a what among uh, the Muslims engaged in interreligious Islamo-Christian dialogue, uh, you have stated that at the beginning of this uh, wonderful uh, presentation, the what I would call the asymmetric relation between uh, uh, Quran and Bible, 
in terms of uh, comparatively uh, one would say that the Quran corresponds to Jesus in terms of revelation and Mary could be uh, a, a counterpart of, of Muhammad as those who have been somehow facilitated the revelation according to Islamic and according to Christian revelation. And so starting from this perspective, uh, my, the question would be the narrative you have presented of the Quran, of the prophets, could uh, the narrative uh, of uh, uh, relation God and family, the three prophets you have uh, presented, uh, Moses and uh, um, Noah, uh, uh, could, uh, could this be interpreted also for Christians as a more symbolic narrative in terms of that uh, might help us together to consider with the different doctrinal perspectives that uh, the links are more to be considered on a more symbolic uh, value and rather than a metaphysical uh, dimension rather than a metaphorical dimension uh, so 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 we, we can try to understand that uh, our family links uh, are as a priority spiritual family links uh, to a common god and to a common absolute principle rather than uh, and which does not neglect the blood links uh, or the specific identities of Christian and Muslim communities or of the communities that go, uh, that follow one specific prophet. So I think that this, this, if this narrative could be uh, considered, and the, the, but uh, 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 going back to asymmetric uh, uh, interpretation, then this would or can have an, an exception, which is the narrative of the Quran on Jesus. Because as you have mentioned, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, in a different way, in comparison to all the other prophets mentioned in the Quran, he is also Qawl al-Haq. He is the only prophet who has the quality uh, to in somehow inspire the, 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 the spirit and life. Uh, and, and so, and so it, it, this also gives Muslims probably a common occasion to, uh, to Discuss, to discover Christology in terms of a eschatological perspective. It's a question. Thank you. That was a beautiful question. Uh, and I feel that the answer won't be up to it, the level of the question. Um, in some ways, I feel that as someone who works principally as an academic scholar, I do a bit of the philological or historical work but the really important constructive work, I leave it to the, the, the theologians. Um, but I can't help but mention, I mean, someone who, who worked in this direction is um, Muhammad Ahmed Khalaf Allah, the, uh, the interpreter who wrote his Fan um, al-Qasasi for Quran in the uh, early 20th century, a dissertation that was controversial at the time in Egypt who speaks about the narrative, the narrative art of the Qur'an, and he contrasts historical readings of biblical narratives um, with symbolic readings, precisely. And, of course, this led to some controversy because he was challenged with or accused of, um, of not acknowledging the historical truth of Qur'anic narratives, etc. But, um, you know, one could take different approaches. One could take only a symbolic approach, and one can assert different levels, as many interpreters have different ideas of of levels of the Qur'an, of Zahir and Baltan and these sorts of things. So, um, yeah, ab absolutely. And um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the Jesus narrative in the Qur'an, uh, I think the Qur'an gives us a very distinctive Christology, which I didn't focus, focus much on. Uh, the Qur'an is very interested in uh, Christ's place, and he's distinguished not only by miracles, but of course also by his birth, not also by his birth, but by his, his, his childhood. He performs miracles and speaks prophetically as a baby. Of course, he speaks in the Mahad. He speaks in the, the cradle. Uh, and then, of course, by his, his death or his, his deathless ascension into heaven. So there's a lot of important work to be done on that question. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your exposition. I have two questions. The first, I want to speak about the centrality of the world in Judaism, in uh, Islam, and uh, in Christianism. I, uh, according to your exposition, the world, the speech of God, is the main point of, uh, of uh, the free religion. Catholicism, uh, Islam, and uh, uh, Judaism. But uh, through the through centuries, those words have been elaborated uh, by, with influences from Mesopotamia and uh, other cultures. And today, how can we understand the centrality reach of other cultures? Because even, even the, the Quran, the Quran is elaborated with the influence of Christianism and other cultures. And at the same time, Christianism is influenced by Judaism and other cultures. And today, what can be the main point of dialogue that we can elaborate to be able to understand ourselves? Thank you. And the second point is about the family. Uh, Pharaoh was for Moses, Moses' uh, father at the beginning, and after that, he has become uh, the persecutor of Moses. And uh, in the case of Noah, Noah wanted to save his family, and uh, he had, you said that he had a son who was not uh, right, who would be from, from another family. So that is a complete family, and when we analyze the question of family in Judaism, we can see that it is a problem at the beginning, the problem of tribes, of people after the exile from Babylon, that they want to explain the crisis, the internal crisis, for example, the problem of love, Lot, uh, with his, his doctors who had intercourses with him, and they explain that it is to see that uh, the Edomites and the Moabites are two people, is that right? Right then. Yeah. And then, what is the... Uh, how can we understand okay. today the group of family? And family. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you for both questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so... Um, I, I, and the, the first... Um, well, let me start with this. the second point about family before getting back to, to word, the notion of word. Uh, I, I think... In both cases, we have something historical with this question of family family conflict, um, where a new religious movement necessarily causes some dissension inside of the community. And we see that both both uh, prophetic voices uh, in the Quran and in the New Testament, um, they encourage fidelity first to God and then to family. So um, that's a problem pastorally <laughs> today. <laughs> it's a problem pastorally, I mean, in, in both cases. Because, um, you know, you have cases where inside the family someone stops believing or converts to another religion. Um, what do you deal with then? I think the most important thing is to put the scripture in its original context and that th this, um, this firm message of believing in God above everything, even abandoning family members, that is meant for the original context when the community was in a crisis of its birth. But in today's context, we have to understand that differently. It's the whole process of interpretation of a religious text. So my text is not, a, not in any way, my lecture is not in any way advocacy for abandoning family members um, <laughs> uh, for, for either tradition. Um, and then, uh, I mean, it's a very serious issue. Um, it happens in both traditions, but you know, I have a friend who's a convert from Islam to Christianity, who's received death threats from his family, and you also have conversions the other way where you can have serious consequences um, within a family. So that, that's a serious issue. I, I don't mean to make light of it. Um, in terms of word, well, um, yeah, in both traditions, the, the prophetic word is, is important and is, um, I think, translated through different cultures. I don't come from, um, I, I try to give my lectures, although I'm a Catholic, I try to give my lectures from a historical perspective, so you can see influences in both cases, historical um, influences, and that doesn't mean the texts are not revealed. In both cases, you can see God working through histories and cultures, and that, that's fine. 
Uh, and in fact, that could lead, as you suggest, to an appreciation for other cultures by seeing that um, scriptures come, come through this collaborative experience. accepted in a homiletic class <laughs> that when you are preaching you say what is contrary to what is in the bible and that will be considered as a homily i don't know if uh, right. that would not be more or less like a heresy instead of a homily right thank, thank you for that challenging question and i i certainly see your, see your point i mean the quran is working um outside of the bounds of either jewish or christian tradition and so maybe that's another reason why I should, I should abandon this whole idea of, of homiletics. Uh, so the, the, as I mentioned before, I think the answer is, is yes and no. Yes, it's homiletic because of the way it calls on the biblical knowledge of its audience and it delivers a religious message. But of course, it's um, working outside of the community of faith of either Jewish or Christian tradition. But I would say it's important to keep in mind that in the 7th century Middle East, you have many different religious currents, not only Orthodox Jewish and Christian currents, but a lot of heterodox Jewish and Christian currents, other religious traditions such as Zoroastrianism, Samaritanism, um, Manichaeanism, which are competing for interpretations of God's revelation. And then we have this new entrance into the scene of this new voice, the Quranic voice, in which clearly the Quran is interested in um, insisting that the prophetic figures known from the Bible, in fact, belong to the Islamic tradition. And so, right, it's a homiletic voice, but not from inside the church, from outside the church. Two more. Could you okay. And we'll continue informally over the reception, please. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Gabriel, for your conference. I enjoyed it very much. I have a brief uh, comment and a very short question. My comment is about your definition of uh, the Islamic or Quranic uh, theology of revelation. And you mentioned that the Prophet uh, has a sign. I, I don't find that the Prophet in the Quran or in the tradition was called as a sign. As Uswa, as you said, as a model of imitation, uh, we find Jesus Christ, Mary, in a very explicit way, called as a sign, but not the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and in the Quranic theology of uh, Revelation, we find a third category of signs. So natural, cosmic signs, then uh, the scriptures, verbal signs, then the third category, or the anfusicum in yourselves. It's difficult to interpret and to understand because it could be in yourselves, in human beings, in your cultures, your nations, your even religions, or in uh, inside yourself, your, your inner life, your interior uh, spiritual uh, dimension. So this third category in, uh, is very important. Uh, my brief uh, question is what about the Abyssinian tradition? Is it useful also as the Syriac tradition to answer the Quran? Well, okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful question. And, and you don't mean the tradition of the first Hijra, the Abyssinia. You mean generally, Ab generally Ethiopic literature. Okay, so thank you, first of all, for this important point about science, Fiyan Fusikum. Um, that I'll keep that in mind, and maybe we can speak later. In terms of the Abyssinian tradition, um, it seems to be quite important for certain Quranic vocabulary. Um, for example, uh, some vocabulary in Surat al-Ma'idah, notably the word Maida itself, um, is um, a word used for the Eucharistic table, um, 
in Ethiopic tradition, and even more specifically in Psalm 78, there's a reference to the Israelites asking, can God bring down a table in the desert? In the word, in the, in the, in a, if you read the Greek, you won't make much of it, but if you read the Ethiopic Bible, the Ge'ez Bible, the word is Me'ida, or whatever it is in Ethiopic, I don't know offhand. But also, Hawariyun, um, this is an interesting case, because, of course, if you read it based on Arabic alone, you think of white, because the root seems to be Hur, which means white. But, um, and so then you get these traditions that, oh, all of the apostles, they must have been bleachers, they must have... That must have been their job. They bleach clothing white. Even Muhammad Assad, the Austrian convert, in his translation, he wonders if the apostles might have been members of Qumran because the Qumran community wore white. But when you read it in the light of Ethiopic, the Ethiopic word Hawariya is simply, it means walking literally, but it's what's used for, um, for disciples in the Ethiopic Bible. So there, there are important cases like that. Yeah, uh, I would like to thank you very much for the presentation. I was really touched by uh, the, the lesson you, you really gave at the end about uh, the issue of family conflicts and disagreement of believers, somebody who has the freedom to believe and not to believe, and what that uh, means for, for recent uh, interpretations of some interpretations of the Bible, of the Quran, and some views, extreme views, some uh, some Islamic countries hold about, uh, for instance, apostasy, and uh, and others. I think uh, this is an area that needs really to be <coughs> to be uh, to be lessons that need to be drawn so deeply, uh, so that the scholars in Islam could uh, come to explore this areas and uh, and find a better ways of uh, understanding the Quran and, uh, and the and and the the, the the many goods uh, in, the, in the Quran and uh, secondly uh, uh, from all you have said uh, the first your your your, your first uh, exposition of revelation uh, points out to me uh, one important point which I think uh, is very necessary in our world today. The issue of, uh, of, uh, of creation, the creation, you said that the Quran can be seen as a hymn of praise of God in creation. And uh, the Bible also, uh, 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 in many passages, praises the work of God in creation. And I don't think that scholars have tried to explore the possibility of uh, forming a global theology based on the on, the, on this unity of